So I'm Bill Dowley and I want to welcome all of you uh, site stewards who managed to win your way through uh, obviously a challenging uh, first set of uh, <clears throat> little obstacles. Um, I'm the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest and a Tucson Basin nonprofit that uh, has been around doing preservation archaeology for the more than three decades. And about three years ago, um, Gary Cantley, who's the archaeologist for the Western region of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, invited us to join uh, his program through a cooperative agreement. And the goal of that resulting partnership has been to stamp out archaeological resource crime, which you might see abbreviated at places today, ARC. Uh, it's on the title slide here. Um, on Indian reservations and even more broadly uh, and ambitiously uh, to, to the extent possible on public lands of the United States. So our plan today is to share uh, with you uh, the goals and methods of the program that has, has come together, this cooperative program, and <clears throat> to um, say thanks to you for the work that you do um, as stewards of, of Arizona's diverse, priceless, and unfortunately threatened archaeological resources. We've uh, really enjoyed working with Sean Hammond, uh, your leader at the Arizona Site Steward Program, and we'll uh, turn it over for a few minutes here for Sean to uh, make a further introduction. Sean? Thank you, Bill. Hello, everyone. This is Sean. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, site stewards, regional and assistant coordinators. And I see that there are some uh, program uh, land managers as well in the training. So great. Great to see everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for signing up for today's uh, training. You know, earlier this year, um, John uh, Welch at Southwest Archaeology uh, reached out to us, offering to provide a uh, free workshop on today's topic. Um, and, you know, they just become such a great uh, partner for, for the Site Steward Program. You know, I, a lot of you might remember earlier this year, you know, they reduced the yearly subscription to their really amazing, credible magazine uh, for, uh, for, for program members. And um, their Archaeology 101 page, please take a look at it. It's, it's an amazing, perfect place for new site stewards um, and active stewards uh, to increase their knowledge of all things Southwest archaeology. So um, just wonderful to be able to work with, with them today. So, you know, one of the most important goals um, in the program is to provide ongoing training uh, to members. Now with COVID, we're, you know, we are having to make a, a switch to provide training such as this online. Uh, so, but today's list of speakers is an amazing uh, group of individuals uh, and dedicated cultural preservationists. So we are really lucky to have them all here today uh, to talk to us. Um, so thank you to all the, all the speakers and um, yeah, thank you very much. Back to you, Bill. Thanks, Sean. So just a, a couple of uh, quick logistics. Um, First of all, as you probably got from the title there, um, in the mention of Indian country, we're going to be focused on tribal lands uh, today. And I think we should all um, be aware fully that um, tribal lands today are just a tiny fraction of the traditional territories that uh, of modern tribes. And we should uh, recall that the public lands and as the private lands where you and I are, are uh, coming together from today are also the traditional lands of, of one or more tribe in the past. Um, we will have time at the end of this to uh, do a question and answer period. And uh, we're gonna turn things over to Stacy Ryan, a preservation, preservation archeologist here at Archeology span Southwest who heads our team in this cooperative agreement and uh, Stacy, the show is all yours. Thanks, Bill. 
And uh, thank you all for being here with us today. And I hope some of you that emailed me were able to get in with our technical difficulties here. So as Bill said, I'm going to um, fill you in a little bit on what we've been up to these past few years. You know, we entered into this cooperative agreement with the BIA in 2018, and our mission is to end looting and vandalism on tribal lands. These acts are sometimes carried out by people who have ties to other crimes, and these trespassers are a real threat to tribal security and tribal sovereignty. In our work, we focus on our four main goals. We work to prevent archeological resource crime with outreach efforts that are geared to increase public awareness and promote heritage stewardship. We detect violations by increasing site monitoring efforts and spreading the news about how to report a violation or a suspect. We respond in a swift manner to conduct field damage assessments to define and quantify the damage. And we work with tribal agencies to identify the most appropriate ways to remediate impacts and prevent further loss so that we can protect these important places. Our team responds to possible ARPA violations in the BIA Western region of Arizona, Utah, and Nevada, and we work in other states throughout the West as needed. We respond to both criminal and civil violations, and I'm sure it won't surprise um, any of you to hear that the nature of the damage is always different. It may involve looter holes, disturbed burials, vandalized petroglyphs, or it could be damage that was caused by utility or construction companies. Our field damage assessment team, which we call our response team, includes a law enforcement officer, a lead archeologist, an osteologist, tribal cultural resource specialists, and other experts as needed. And because it's a crime scene, law enforcement is considered the lead on the projects, not the archaeologist. We have to respond quickly so that the evidence is preserved. And if we determine that the looting is in fact a few years old, then we can use the field work as an opportunity to conduct a damage assessment training exercise. Following the field work, we write up our damage assessment report. Uh, we determine archeological values following standards put forth by the Society for American Archeology. span And then that report goes to the prosecutor um, to be used in the courts. Next slide, please. I don't know if you diligently looked for Sean's watch. Or Restoration and repair um, are a really important part of the damage assessment process. No, that was we coordinate with tribal historic preservation offices um, to determine the best course of action to mitigate the damage, and we might rely on interviews with community members who can inform on how the damage might interrupt traditional practices. Uh, our restoration efforts can include immediate action, such as backfilling looter holes at the end of a damage assessment or removing graffiti with a product referred to as elephant snot. And there are solutions that call for more planning and consultation, such as site stabilization. Uh, we can install fences or other types of barricades, place advisory signs, revegetate the area, or conduct cultural sensitivity trainings. Next slide, please. We try to include elements of training and building in everything that we do. We conduct ARPA orientation trainings with tribal rangers and cultural resource specialists about how to detect and respond to a crime scene on an archeological site. And uh, one of our major efforts this year was the publication of the Guide to Field Investigations. This is something that the BIA has been working on for several years and we have our first edition out. The guide details best practices for conducting field damage assessments, and it's being distributed to select federal agencies and law enforcement. We also advertise with billboards in heavily impacted areas, and we're always looking for opportunities to get our message to people who are active out on the landscape. We are really excited because right now we are preparing to launch our Save History campaign. Our website, safehistory.org, is nearly complete and it's gonna serve for the foundation of this campaign. And our goals for this are to raise awareness that archeological resource crime on tribal lands is a serious problem. Uh, we are going to share stories from tribal stewards about the value of heritage sites and how they are linked to identity and traditional practices. 
And we wanna let people know that there is a place to report violations through our confidential tip line or we'll have a toll-free number set up. So since the onset of our cooperative agreement, we have responded to reports on six reservations. We've conducted five damage assessments and we've brought several older damage assessment reports to completion. Uh, we continue to work to increase monitoring of vulnerable sites um, throughout Indian country. And we are continuously looking for opportunities to engage with different communities to help protect cultural resources. Um, it's really, we're always pleased to stay in communication with organizations like yours that share our mission to protect these important places. So now I'm gonna hand it over to John Welch. John is the Director of Archaeology Southwest Landscape and Site Preservation Program, and he's on the faculty at Simon Fraser University. John has also served in the past as the Historic Preservation Officer for the White Mountain Apache Tribe, and he plays a major role in several of our ARPA initiatives. And he's going to talk to you about why we need to look for innovative ways to end archaeological resource crimes on tribal lands. Over to you, John. Oh, thank you so much, Stacy, and um, thank you, Sean, for making this possible, and for Bill for allowing us to put this all together and, and lending your time as well. And of course, most importantly, thanks to all of the site stewards for your amazing work and for um, you know dedicating this additional time to learning more about what we're up to and 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 you know thinking more about ways to do an even better job in protecting these invaluable resources. It's falling to me to explain, uh, you know, do some preaching to the choir in a way and explain in a little bit more explicitly why we would go to the trouble of kind of rethinking how we do ARPA uh, implementation and why we would try to do an even better job than, than we've been doing. Uh, well, you know, first and foremost, I guess, and most fundamentally, uh, something that we all know is that time's not on our side here. You know, we're talking about unique, uh, fragile resources, um, not enough reporting, not enough damage assessment being done, and of course, not enough uh, ever uh, prosecution and, and, uh, and remediation for these things. A couple of, uh, you know, southwestern sites, one at Hamalavi and another one at Brush Mountain Ruin on, on the, the right of the screen there to show the incredible and sometimes really horrific extent of some of the damage associated with this, you know, an entire large, deep Pueblo room chunked out uh, in search for burials uh, underneath the room floors. Um, so we're working against the clock in many ways and making use of all the resources we can. So then the next question is if, if why we would be really doing this focus on tribal lands. Obviously it's because our primary partner is the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but also in a lot of ways, it's important to recognize that we do this work because tribal lands are disproportionately affected uh, and tribal communities are disproportionately affected by this form of crime. Uh, tribal communities have more and you know, more profound values associated with these places, relying on them, not just as sources of information, but as points of orientation on landscapes, elements of identity and connectivity to the past, um, direct lineage pasts, that aren't always familiar to non-native peoples. The other reason for doing it is, you know, proved up by the fact that so many of you are lending your, your precious time to it, that there are outside allies ready to help with this, that um, it's a question of working to uh, find better ways to reawaken uh, sometimes dormant or other types of, uh, I guess, call them stewardship ethics here, uh, you know, the past, emphasis on really on a top-down law enforcement focused response to archaeological resource crime has made it so that communities sometimes feel left out. And we think that that's something that can be changed and that we can harness community values and interests in order to do a better job. Tribal lands are good places to do that because they're overlap jurisdictions. There's, you know, when you enter onto tribal lands, you are under their civil jurisdiction, not criminal jurisdiction, but you're under their civil jurisdiction. And so you can be, uh, you know, found responsible for damaging tribal lands in tribal courts, uh, and also then uh, prosecuted, of course, for ARPA violations in federal courts. So that's what we mean by overlap jurisdictions. There's also, and many of you are familiar with, 
the, and we'll hear more from, you know, directly from a, a member of a, of, a, of a THPO office here momentarily, uh, that there are these tribal historic preservation offices, cultural preservation offices, cultural programs, cultural centers, and other institutions that are grounded in local values and very concerned with and able to respond to um, archaeological resource crime. And then, you know, uh, as proved up here by Louis Zosba, uh, one of the White Mountain Apache tribe game rangers, you know, there is a cadre of armed and badged um, law enforcement officials on tribal lands who are out there on the land, um, keeping an eye out for it, uh, you know, misbehavior and poor use of, of their lands. And so it's another weapon, I guess, to say, that can be harnessed more effectively in tribal lands that makes it more valuable. And it's all about sovereignty from the tribal point of view, that anything that can be done in order to increase the capacities for self-governance and for uh, the regulation of lands and people on uh, tribal lands is gonna be welcomed and appreciated in, in tribal contexts. There's probably some other good reasons too, and we'll let that um, come forward perhaps in the question and answer. Um, program here. So the third round of response is like, you know, all of a sudden we look around us and we've got all these tools and not all of them fully utilized. Uh, tools in stewardship, tools in law enforcement, tools in community advocacy, and also tools here in science, in, uh, in archaeological science more specifically. So in a lot of ways, some of the thinking and the, the action going on in our program is traceable to this group of uh, incredible colleagues here. Um, that assembled in October of 2018 up at Fort Apache on tribal lands to talk more about what might be done in order to, you know, kind of get a new generation of ARPA uh, assistance and enforcement going. And part of it really came to focus on, geez, what else can archaeologists do and led to the launch of a archaeological science set of applications, most especially through uh, the use of forensic sedimentology um, with specific reference to the kinds of ways that archaeologists especially know a lot about dirt and can be and can bring that knowledge to bear on on archaeological resource crime. Um, so we've got the personnel in order to do a good job. We figured let's let's get them busy. And then, you know, kind of a reprise of my first thing is like if we're not going to do it now, then when? The fact of the matter is that the values of antiquities uh, on art markets is going up. Um, steadily. You know, they aren't making any more of things made a thousand years ago. It seems kind of obvious, but it's another way that we're effectively working against the clock, working against economic markets, and we have to up our game if we want to do a better job and find new ways to, to deal with these things. So um, with that, I am going to in, uh, turn it over to Gary Cantley. Um, my awesome colleague in the Bureau of Indian Affairs and really the guy the most responsible for making this program um, possible. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, site stewards. It's certainly a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to wave my arms a little bit, although it's doing from the dining room table and not out there in front of you, interacting with you, which we all would prefer, of course, but uh, that's the way it goes right now. The Archaeological Resources Protection Act, something with which I've been working since 1992, and that's when I started with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and it's been one of those uh, uh, aspects of the job that I've taken and run with, along with all the others, but this is one that's been very rewarding but, you know, it's over, over a long career, as, as I've enjoyed with the BIA that I've uh, been able to capitalize on. And now I'm at Resist, where we inter get to interact with the great folks over at Archaeology Southwest, who we all know are great friends of the archaeological community in Arizona and beyond, for that matter. Four things to kind of remember just to start off, okay, when we talk about ARPA is no one goes on federal or Indian land and collects artifacts, can't do that. The second is, we always need to remind uh, the law enforcement is that you have another tool because when these guys aren't robbing graves, they're poaching, they're stealing cactus, 
and they're involved in marijuana or at least at drugs, okay, for that matter. And it's that tool is that there are some very potentially very serious uh, penalties that can be applied against in that, all right? And the fourth thing, just to remember right off the bat, is there is a reward up to $500 for information leading to a conviction. Uh, but it is the policy uh, because there is sometimes quite a lag between apprehension and conviction that uh, it's a policy of the BIA regional archeologist out of Phoenix, me, that you get a steak dinner if you give any information leading to the apprehension, okay? So remember that. I always like to go and start with uh, the preamble of ARPA when, in 1979, almost well over 40 years ago now, where Congress, the purpose of this act, to secure present and future benefit of the American people, all their archeological resources on public and Indian lands. That's a very important thing for us, but also something I need to remind my federal counterparts as well. The professional archeological community, private individuals having collections. We need to be interacting with them too. And we're charged in that regard. Let's go to the next slide. This is the meat of ARPA. These are the things that the federal government has to prove in order for us to have that criminal conviction against an individual who goes out it steals artifacts on federal Indian land. The first one right there, we have to establish there is indeed an archaeological resource. Any material remains, a past human life or, or activity, a scientific interest, those over 100 years of age, okay, that's a crucial thing right there. And so you can tell that perhaps I've been doing this too long <laughs> and I and really appreciate what, how smart the individuals who wrote these regulations are, that I actually see beauty in what they've done, as a matter of fact. This is very broad definition, and we use it to good effect in that regard. We are encouraged to read that very broadly. The second element that we have to establish that there was indeed a prohibited act, besides there being an archeological resource. Some individual went out excavated, damaged, or altered that archeological resource. Next, we have to establish that it happened on federal or Indian land. Federal land, not only the Park Service, Forest Service, BLM, but likewise could be military reservations, Army Corps of Engineers, there's a wide range of others once you start looking at that. Indian lands means lands that are held in trust. Indian tribes can own land, that would be like referred to as fee simple, pretty much just like private property, okay? It has to be brought into trust status with, for, with, recognized by the federal government in that regard. Without a permit. Now the type of individuals that we're going after, they don't need no stinking permit. <laughs> you know, if they're out there at midnight, in some remote part of the reservation, they're not having, a, they're not doing so with a permit, okay? But we established that. Now, if it's going to be either a federal felony or misdemeanor, the difference is whether or not that damage is over $500. Stacy referred to that earlier when she mentioned archaeological value. And that's something that once we do, we go out and we uh, process the, the crime scene, we come back, and then we calculate various values, okay? Archaeological value is one of those which is basically what would it cost to sanction, in a sanctioned manner, re retrieve the information in that hole, in that looter's hole, that would have been tangible prior to the violation. The other one is the commercial value of the artifacts involved in that violation, the fair market value of those. And the third uh, uh, value we need to come up with is the cost of restoration and repair. This is what conditions we would take to bring the site to the condition it was immediately before the violation. Um, bottom line, when we talk with uh, law enforcement, if they have an ARPA case, 
we encourage them to go ahead and think of it immediately. One, as a crime scene. Second, as a, potential, as a felony case. Because for us to reach that $500 threshold is, does not require very much, okay? So those, that's the meat of it right there. Next slide, please. ARPA provides for criminal penalties. Individuals go to jail. The civil portion of it, that's where we go, where we've interacted mostly with those individuals who out of negligence have gone into an archeological site on an Indian reservation in my case, of course, and uh, uh, damaged an archeological site, let's say by trenching for a fiber optic line without permission, okay? They just push through. They're typically, doesn't have so much anymore, but back in the early days, people would go ahead and do something with the intent of just saying they're sorry later. Well, if they clipped an archeological site, they are sorry because we basically sue them and we win those, okay, for sure. And then we remind them that ARPA allows us to go after them after that bulldozer or that backhoe under forfeiture. Now, another thing that we need to add on to this is, and John Welch alluded to this earlier too, is the tribal ordinances that may apply. Now, wait, some tribes have some very good uh, tribal or cultural resource protection ordinances. Others, they skip that and where they would go after individuals for trespass, the looters for trespass, okay? Their tribal ordinances allow them to go after triple damages in this one particular case. And the way they calculate those damages is the way we do through the, through doing our ARPA damage assessment. So, and there's not, it's a little technicality, but they can go after, it's not an issue of double jeopardy in that instance, okay? Next slide. Here's the lovely part of this, okay? Where do you site stewards fit in? You know, one thing, another, another little rule that we go by, you know, if the individuals aren't looting in your backyard, they're on Indian land, they're on, they don't recognize jurisdictions, that's the bottom line. They're gonna be on, on other forest service land or wherever, okay? And so where y'all fit in, even though you might not be working on Indian land, those working on other types of federal property or state land for that matter, uh, there's chances are that these individuals have been working on our land as well, okay? So that's another thing where we wanna, looters don't recognize jurisdictions, okay? So you're actually a very, just being on the ground out there, deterring looting, that behavior. That's very cruel. Just knowing that we have site stewards out there. And also just interacting with the public, an enthusiastic, friendly, knowledgeable face for the whole preservation community is so much appreciated. And just stepping back and just being a little self-aware about how your peers and other social settings may be looking at you as this physically, mentally alive individual. So it looks like Gary may have frozen there. Um, Dusty, are you ready to take over and discuss this, uh, your, your crime scene investigation essentials? Dusty, let me go ahead and let me do a quick little thing real fast, though, to introduce you, okay? And uh, folks, uh, Dusty Whiting, he is the tip of our spear. And what that means is he's usually the very first one to get out. If we get a report, he's the individual who is always the one we first look to, to step up and get out there, do a quick assessment of it and let us know what we've got up against. I have a relationship with him that's dating back over 20 years now, Dusty. And, yes, sir. Uh, and it's been a very fruitful one and we're very happy to be able to build a, depend on you as we do for all the good work that I'm sure will become readily apparent during your course of your presentation. And so let go ahead and don't tell them all the stories that you've got behind you because we, but because we are limited a little bit. Otherwise, they're going to kick you off like they did me, I guess. So. Yeah, I know that Bill's got his finger on the trigger out there. Uh, 
Let's see. So I, I started to introduce myself. Thank you guys all for participating. Uh, Gary's kind words there. I was an agent with the Bureau of Indian Affairs for 20 years, uh, retired several years ago. And uh, prior to my retirement, as Gary said, I was able to provide some help in these type of investigations. And uh, I came to learn what a bunch of wonderful people, the archeologists, the historic preservation officers, what a bunch of dedicated people to our cause. And uh, as uh, good fortune would have it, eventually we got into a nice agreement with Archaeology Southwest and we now have a much larger, uh, much more well-funded effort out there including bringing on people like John Welch, and, uh, who, who brings a whole treasure trove of relationships to what we're doing. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Sean and Dave Salgi, uh, we set aside a little bit of time last fall at the, at the Grand Canyon um, seminar or training session. And I shared some ideas with people about uh, how to be alert for and perceive and be alert uh, as far as tracks or footwear impressions at the sites, tire impressions, that kind of stuff. Because a lot of times, as you guys know out in the field, that, that might be the first thing that you pick up on, that somebody's been driving in the area or walking in the area and then you get tuned into something else that's happening out there. Okay? When, when you people are in the field, you will have learned or you will learn quickly that patience needs to become your middle name, okay? Uh, the site stewards are involved in a noble and serious service. And there may be occasions in your service where further investigation and prosecution takes place. And of course, if we get in that legal realm, your conduct is going to be closely examined, okay? The, the, the instance or incident that you discovered might set into effect a whole series uh, of events affecting somebody's livelihood and maybe their freedom if they uh, should be sentenced to jail for any of their activities. So all of your activities are gonna be closely examined by the court. Always conduct yourself in a professional, unbiased fashion. Never add anything to your report that isn't true, that didn't happen. And try not to leave things out, try to keep all the uh, pertinent things in your report. Do not be frustrated when when you're finding and report to your coordinator and report to law enforcement happens, and then you don't get get any feedback for some for some time. Okay, we all get conditioned uh, nowadays in our our never ending media onslaught to think that the whole thing is gonna be resolved in an hour, that law enforcement's gonna get out there and collect the evidence and interview people and send things to the lab and get this DNA report back and we're gonna have a prosecution and an arrest and uh, conviction all in time for the next soap opera to come on the screen. It, it just doesn't happen like that, okay? Some of your stewards know and our people know, you, you spend hours getting to a site sometimes and. We know from our investigations, uh, we've spent years trying to identify people that have been at the sites and have looted the site. So there's nothing speedy in this program at all. Um, everybody needs to just get to their birth certificates and put patients in your middle name. Um, I learned from one of my good fellow investigators, uh, you, you really have to understand and think about this principle given to us many years ago by Edmund Locard, was a, an early criminalist, if you wanna call him that. And he really did a good job of verbalizing how at a crime scene, the bad guy brings something to the scene and takes something from the scene. You know, and it may be a very small item, hair, fiber, soil, those kind of things. So we should be thinking in that regard when we're thinking about what kind of potential evidence might be at a scene. Uh, those of us at Archaeology Southwest have really had some tremendous uh, success story the past couple of years working with the 
the sediment samples and soil that's uh, putting our bad guys at a specific scene. So if soil that we've collected um, from them, from their tools, from their vehicles, from their clothing, um, we're, we have a whole program that's focused on that. It's just very exciting for everybody that's involved. Um, it's easy in the field to have a lot of thoughts, a lot of concerns, a lot of considerations. And uh, years ago, I learned from another old investigator, older investigator, uh, that most of us can count to four. Most of us can memorize four things. And so if we can keep in mind that we're always going to do everything safely, that we're going to communicate, uh, we might be a couple slides behind there, whoever has their finger on the slide button. Let's come up with another one, maybe. There you go. Thank you. Uh, we do everything safely. We communicate with each other. Free, direct, and frequent communication with your partner and your field coordinator or regional coordinator, just they make everything run smoothly. Or if you're not doing that, you're going to have all kinds of uh, rough spots and uh, speed bumps to get over and around as you're, as you're going. Le the legality of what we're doing, we do everything legally. And I'm also a site steward for our region. So I'm familiar with the administrative paperwork nightmare in a nice way, Sean, um, that goes with all the stewards having all their paperwork in order with the myriad land managers out there, okay? Kind of fits under the patient thing that I'm talking about. Work your way through all those forms with your coordinator, make sure that everything's on file, everything's up to date, so there's no, no weird question or criticism of what you're doing later. Make sure your permission slips are up to date. And then it, as I said before about patients, it takes as long as it takes. Whatever it takes you to do that monitoring, to do that hike, to find some disturbance or some odd circumstance and report that uh, to your manager and do your report, all that kind of stuff. Be patient, but you only get one shot at that scene. So you got to do it right the first time, okay? So let's all uh, have that in mind. Next slide, please. If you discover some suspicious activity or actual looting or vandalism at, at a site, um, Gary talked about thinking of that as a crime scene. And, and that's really what you need to start thinking. Your role as a non-law enforcement person is to observe and report, but with minimal intrusion to that site, okay? Your report, your handful of photographs are gonna be very simple compared to what law enforcement is going to be required to do later. Okay? As tempting as it is, once you see solid evidence that something has happened there, stop, back out, report what you saw. Don't go, don't keep digging, don't keep walking, don't keep tracking up the scene, don't contaminate that scene further, right? Report what you discovered to your coordinator, you are not a law enforcement official that you're starting to get out of your boundaries beyond your authority, okay? And I know it's hard, but don't disrupt the integrity of that scene. Let's be professionals about what we're doing. Next slide, please. We covered a little bit of that. Um, you know, being on kind of all three sides as a, uh, a former federal agent and currently conditioned as a, or commissioned as a, a tribal ranger and being a site steward and working with the archaeologists, you kind of get everybody's perspective, right? Um, and, and you have to have a good understanding that this incident, although significant, important, exciting uh, for you as a steward, really in the grand scheme of things might be not quite as grandiose as you think. It's a little simpler type thing. So law enforcement is gonna to have to consider all their resources, all the other responsibilities they have, and your incident is gonna get a 
a priority assigned to it that may not be what you think it should be. Okay? And another thing to keep in mind is sometimes um, our looters, our bad guys are working across multiple jurisdictions. There are multiple agencies involved in the investigation. And you, you may never, I would say you probably never will. You may never see the big picture as to what, what really happened, so to speak, or how your piece of the puzzle fit into a much larger uh, investigation. Uh, so be patient with that. Just do your part, do it professionally. You know, we, I think we all work without very much thanks. Um, get used to that because we're doing it um, out of our faith and our, our belief in what we're doing. You know, there's, there's no big reward at the end of the day for most of us. Um, so we, we just have to believe in what we're doing. Do, do it professionally. Okay. Now, I've also seen situations where the site stewards who just had the best uh, positive personality and attitude, they were able to educate the law enforcement folks a little bit about what, what this whole archeological resource crime is all about, okay? Because I'm here to tell you, the average cop doesn't know, doesn't have time, is not interested. They have other priorities beyond and away from from the kind of things that we're concerned with. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> you know, we don't wanna be doomsayers. Uh, I'm just pointing out some of the things we should keep in mind because there are, there is a larger group, a larger perspective in this whole thing. Um, some years ago, I haven't seen it so much lately, but a few years ago, there was a lot of media attention uh, given to all the artifact sales that were happening in Europe. All many, many artifacts that were stolen or looted or improperly sold and then uh, made it to, to France and uh, were be, being on the auction block, particularly Hopi and Zuni artifacts come to mind. So there was a little bit of uh, national and international attention that came to all those, uh, came with all that. And that resulted in the establishment or reestablishment of a position to coordinate these archeological resource, resource crimes with, within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So some funding was set aside, some positions were established, additional training funds were um, earmarked, training sessions were held, all that kind of stuff. And so we, so we have a, a handsome young fellow, Frank Chavez, Special Agent Frank Chavez. He's assigned to the Albuquerque office, but his responsibilities are nationwide. And he's been our good ally in, in numerous cases, really. He has a winning personality. You can't help but like the guy. And he is, he is just a workhorse. He is busy and gone all the time. And I've spent many personal hours with Frank. He is one dedicated individual. He totally understands the issues and he's all about trying to help everybody that he can. Now we're posting his direct cell phone number there without his wife's knowledge, but you feel free to contact him, text him, give him what you got and he, he will coordinate with other people to help resolve your issues. Shannon is gonna follow me in a minute as another preservation archeologist. She's kind of new to Archaeology Southwest, but has a great background. And uh, she'll share her perspective as, as an experienced archaeologist, kind of getting immersed in the ARPA issues the past couple of years. So she has some good things to say to you as well. Thanks, Dusty. So before starting with the ARC Southwest team about a year ago, I worked for a decade in cultural resource management, mostly doing archeological surveys in the Western US. So I've seen a ton of looted and vandalized sites and it definitely seems worse here in the Southwest. Um, next slide, please. Um, CRM projects have a totally different priority um, different priorities and timelines because we're often working in advance of huge infrastructure projects. Um, so we would see a snapshot of a site on a particular day. It makes it hard to assess change over time or assess how recent or fresh damage is. 
Um, site condition often ended up being just a single line in the report or on a form or a blob drawn on a map. So we don't, we weren't necessarily creating great baseline data. The unfortunate reality is that CRM archaeologists are making priority assessments about damage in the field, often without much training or experience or knowledge about archaeological resource crimes. Um, federal archaeologists get a little bit more training, but it sounds like they're often on sites less because they have other priorities and responsibilities. Um, I've definitely heard some stories about crews messing up forensic evidence on sites, and I personally didn't really learn much when I got my bachelor's about ARPA. I probably learned about it from a sign originally, and I didn't understand the complexity of the cases until I went to graduate school. I probably tended to assume a lot of damage was old. So there are just a lot of barriers to reporting, like do field crews know who to report to? Are they sure enough about what they're seeing to stop work? Um, do they assume that the land manager already knows? Um, most of the time, there is mention of unauthorized damage or vandalism, but it might end up in a report on a land manager's desk several months later. So there are systemic issues. And I do wonder if CRM archaeologists end up reporting any of these crimes and what kind of percentage of total reports that is. I think now that I've learned more, I would feel a lot more confident about reporting. I'm more attuned to what forensic damage or what forensic evidence looks like. And I would know what to say to law enforcement, what to say to a land manager and how to deal with my manager or a client when I'm telling them I have to stop work so that an investigation can happen. I think it's, I've also learned that you really have to turn that mental switch that Dusty was talking about from exploring an archaeological site to report on it and then transitioning into leaving a crime scene and ignoring your curiosity. I share all this with you guys because what you do is important. You visit the same sites and gain a deep familiarity with them so you can assess change over time and your main priority is detection and long-term protection. Um, so it's really important. Regular comprehensive site monitoring programs are recommended repeatedly in the literature and the Arizona site stewards are often referenced as a model for this. Next slide. Um, damage assessment methods are actually pretty familiar. They're not that different from the usual survey and excavation methods that we use. Um, because in the end, the goal for both is to reconstruct past human behavior and gather supporting evidence. Um, but again, there's that shift to a crime scene mentality and the lead archeologist works under the law enforcement officer. The lead archeologist's goals are to determine whether there is an archeological resource as defined by ARPA, assess the damage to the resource and then prepare a report with values and costs as defined by ARPA. So we take tons of notes, tons of before and after photos, um, we process and screen back dirt, uh, collect artifacts, we draw plan and profile sketch maps, but they're in English, which has been a learning curve for me because I think in metric. Um, damage assessment report writing is pretty similar to a CRM report, but we use, we throw out all our archeological jargon and use more plain and accurate language. We use the statutory language from ARPA and we write for a lay audience. And again, like Gary and Stacy said, the goals of this are to prove that the elements of an ARPA violation are met. Next slide. So the more I learn about this issue of archeological resource crime, the more questions I have. And it seems like some of those are almost unanswerable. There are some resources out there. The citation I have here confirmed a lot of what I'd seen in the field um, about what kind of sites are, are at risk and where they're located on the landscape. There are also reports by the US Government Accountability Office and the NAGPRA Review Committee that sound intimidating, but are actually pretty friendly reads about the scope of the problem and um, tribal responses to some of these issues. Um, so there is a lot of anecdotal evidence out there and some quantitative data, but it's often built on these layered assumptions. We assume there are millions of sites in the West, hundreds of thousands in Arizona, 
Some percentage of those are damaged, a smaller percentage are reported, a smaller percentage are investigated, and a smaller percentage are prosecuted. I do have a couple stats to share with you. Um, more than 70% of cultural items at overseas auctions were affiliated with Southwestern tribes, so the demand is unfortunately high for stuff from the Southwest. Approximately 80% of all looting incidents go unreported. That seems like a generous estimate, and it definitely highlights that there's a problem with reporting. But then over 95% of criminal ARPA prosecutions obtain a guilty finding, and that one should inspire us to keep doing what we're doing because it does, we are effective. Um, I only found two prosecuted cases on tribal land and I hope that there are more out there or maybe they're using tribal ordinances, but that seems like indicative of a problem and some of the disproportionate effects on tribal land that John mentioned before. We really need some persuasive data about this. I'm curious about the scope of archeological resource crime and what it might look like in the future. And for our safe history campaign, we're really looking for more data to convince people that there is a problem. Um, so our next presenter is Randy Re Reem. He's a recently retired assistant US attorney with 35 years of experience. He prosecuted dozens of ARPA cases and taught ARPA classes for the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. I'm looking forward to his case study he's going to talk about today. Thank you, Shannon. Um, as you said, I was a prosecutor in Western Kentucky. There are two districts in Kentucky for 35 years. Just to give you an idea of the resource around here, probably eight or nine miles from where I'm seated, there is a gigantic Indian mound in this beautiful little valley. And we've got a lot of those around here. And it's just like a, for people that would dig into something like that, it's just a sign that says, come and dig me. We also have this phenomenon, and certainly in eastern Kentucky, probably more than western Kentucky, but rock shelters. Uh, the rangers at Mammoth Cave National Park were my clients for many years, and I happen to know that there are 280 cataloged rock shelters at Mammoth Cave National Park, every one of them all the 280 anyway, were arc sites and every one of them has been looted at one time or another. Fortunately, we've got a really good site steward program at Western Kentucky University, my friend Darlene Applegate down there. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of where I come from. Uh, dozens of artifact shows around here, uh, some very expensive artifacts, usually the same people at different shows. Um, it, it's an honor to, uh, to, to address site stewards. My last two criminal cases, one in 2006 and one in 2016, uh, were made by the work of a site steward. And I wanna make some observations about one of those cases. Uh, that is USA v. Uh, Mercurio et al. There were four defendants in that case. And as, as you'll learn, there were really three different cases, a total of nine defendants. And all of these cases were made possible by a woman whose identity I have never known. I didn't want to know, uh, but uh, it, it, this happened at Barron River Lake. And in fact, the, the bad guys learned about these sites at an Indian artifact show at Barron River Lake State Resort Park. Uh, so if you know anything about the Corps of Engineers, they have a so-called winter pool for the lakes uh, they administer. That is, they lower the water level they uh, behind the dam. And so when that happens, slide two, please. When that happens uh, at Marion River, it revealed this island. Uh, it's This island is a national register site. It was a hunting camp for multiple tribes. It has the present, there's a hearth on there, so it's possible to do carbon dating. And there were also a quarry on the shore over there. I think you can almost see it. There's a quarry for Fort Payne Church over there. That's another one of the uh, National Register sites. Now, the defendants in, in my case worked this site at night. They stayed in a motel in my hometown, which is near Glasgow, Kentucky during the day. 
and they quarried buckets of um, plastic buckets of Fort Payne chert, the unique chert to this area and this, this huge quarry that was over there. All this happened in December of 2005. So uh, the lady that I'm talking about, our site steward had noticed some lights on this island at night visible from behind her house, which I just recently drove by there and it's Indian Lake subdivision. But she noticed that there were some lights on the island. She put up a tripod with a, with a, a, a lens on it and looked and, and then she figured out what was going on that these were Native American sites. And she called the Corps of Engineers manager who knew very well that all of these sites were there and had made an effort not to, uh, not to publicize them. So he agreed to keep her identity secret. Now, federal rules of criminal procedure, a little bit different than state court here. I'm not really sure about state court in Arizona, but federal court all over the country, we have rule 16, which does not require the United States to disclose witness names. And you can be sure that the defense in all three of the cases that we made off of that island in 2000, late 2005 and early 2006, they all wanted to know who the informant was. But I was not required to disclose the fact that the manager knew who the lady was and told me this whole entire situation and we kept her name out of reports. So rule 16 says we don't have to give up witness names. Uh, if, used, if we wanted to use her name in a warrant we were still not required to disclose names and warrants. That's certainly the case with drug warrants. Very few of those folks end up being named unless the prosecutor wants to use them as a witness in a trial. Uh, and even then, if somebody's gonna plead or something like that, we are not required to give up a witness list until the person is called to testify in court. So. I do want to mention to you, you may think, what's this Kentucky guy doing talking? I spoke with an AUSA in, in Phoenix this week in preparation uh, for talking to you all. And she had a, a very good point. She said, just make sure uh, if, if you end up getting a little bit too close to the situation, you walk around a corner and someone's there, uh, just make sure that the law enforcement folks keep your name out of any reports. We certainly had that in my case but uh, make sure you're not named in any report because as she points out to me, uh, a lot of times they have to give over the full report and they are not allowed in Arizona to redact the names of witnesses. I can redact the names of witnesses here, but this is all a system run by federal judges and I'm sure you recognize that they are, uh, they are pretty powerful people. The second observation I wanna make about this case is, uh, is the, is the Corps of Engineers law enforcement uh, folks. If you know anything about Corps of Engineers law enforcement, uh, they are not armed, they have no arrest authority, they have no warrant authority. Really all they can do is form partnerships with other agencies. So that's what occurred here. This manager knew these guys were hitting this island at night. He may uh, call the local game warden in this case. I know they also call deputy sheriffs who have full arrest and authority. And, uh, and so he called and made a plan as to what to do. And so when uh, he got a call to, uh, from a lady, the, our site steward, his folks were ready to go and they did something very smart. They, it took them an hour and a half while the sun was up because they, remember these folks were doing this at at night and getting off of there, taking a boat and going back in and hitting the motels during the daytime and doing their excavating at night. But uh, in the hour and a half or so that the Corps of Engineers folks were waiting for the, uh, the, uh, the guys with the guns, the game warden in this case, to get there, they made very detailed notes as to who was on the island, what kind of clothing they had, what they observed them doing. And these observations that they made really made my case because uh, they were able to observe and were willing to testify that all three of the males on the island uh, were, uh, were actually digging. So if I had prosecuted all three, a lot of people think, well, there's holes there, there's folks with shovels there, I can prosecute all three. No, I, well, I, I can't really do it successfully because 
as sure as I'm sitting here, someone would have taken the stand and said, I just went along to, to, uh, to observe and government, it's your responsibility to prove that this person excavated, removed, aided and abetted. Uh, so that's, that's something that they did that was very smart that made my case. The other thing that they did was they noticed that the, the woman who was running the warming tent also was carrying artifacts in buckets. Remember this, this chart that they, these guys wanted to, to take out of this site. So we were able to charge her with aiding and abetting uh, based on, uh, on what um, the Corps of Engineers folks were able to do before the game warden got there and went out and checked the site. So uh, I make this point about this case to show the limitations that we had here with the Corps of Engineers and, and the, their lack of authority. And even with the site steward, we were able to, we couldn't have made the case without her. We couldn't have made the case also without the Corps of Engineers. So with limitations, um, they made very good use of their time. And I, I hope you found this, uh, this little case study, you know, prosecutors love telling war stories, but uh, I hope you found this case study useful. And I hope you'll now give your attention to Woody Aguiar the uh, Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer from the San Ilde Fonso tribe. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, folks. Um, glad to be a part of this um, presentation, uh, this training. I, I was just asked recently, a couple of days ago, actually, to uh, to be a part of this. So I agreed, and I'm, it's, I'm, I'm learning a lot myself, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, I think my role here today is to provide some insight from not only my own experience uh, in tribal historic preservation and archaeology and academia, um, but from a kind of a general tribal um, perspective uh, across Indian country. Um, so hopefully. I, I can get that that point across to you uh, to you folks, and um, I can hopefully some of the uh, information I pass on will be of uh, some interest to you. So, like um, as mentioned, I'm the uh, Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer here at San Aldefonso Pueblo. I helped create the office, the Tipo office here at the Pueblo back in 2017. So we're a relatively uh, young office. Um, but I've been involved uh, since it, its uh, inception. And I'll talk a little bit more about TIPOs uh, later on. So to the topic at hand, um, I mean, there's millions of uh, Native American uh, cultural objects, objects of cultural heritage uh, and state, federal, local and private uh, ownership today. And many of those have um, no ownership history or provenance. Um, you can keep with the same, the same slide actually. Um, because they were either looted uh, or anthropologists, um, when they collected them, kept very poor records. Um, and many of these objects have circulated for decades in the marketplace, uh, for over a century even. Um, and for most of that time, there's been an active trade um, in tribal culture heritage where provenance and ownership history had no legal or practical effect on the market. Uh, however, in the last 25 years or so, uh, awareness of tribal concerns and the harmful destruction of archaeological sites and the trafficking of objects from those places has had some influence on legislation, markets, and the treatment of these places. So I think at the heart of what we're talking about today is really the exploitation and objectification of American Indian culture. Um, and how a settler colonial state, i.e. the United States, is in many ways uh, implicated and complicit in the illegal procurement of Native American cultural heritage. So whether that procurement um, happened 150 years ago or happens today, uh, this kind of need uh, for procuring Native American culture heritage by collectors, uh, museums, even archaeologists underlines and drives a lot of what we're talking about today. So next slide, please. So for Native people, our historical memory reminds us almost on a daily basis 
that the colonial governments that we are part of today began by conquest and that the establishment of political structures, even laws, institutions such as museums, um, even I'd say even academic disciplines like archeology span are not some break from the conquest and war, but an extension of it. Um, so does conquest and war end when the fighting stops? So why should we think of it this way? If we look at indigenous peoples and our lands being still under occupation by a conquering and colonizing power, its laws and institutions being designed to protect and grow the capital it gained from that conquest and colonization. Um, so in the context of today's discussion, um, that'd be tribal cultural heritage or what I call the loot of the empire. Uh, it puts some things into perspective. So because our political institutions and laws were designed for a certain purpose, even though today we have forgotten what that purpose was, it still influences us in a lot of ways because those ideas that allow the illicit taking of tribal cultural heritage are kind of built into the very fabric of its construction. An archeological resource crime stems from the underlying conditions and circumstances of settler colonialism. So the wheels really of archeological resource crime, resources crime were set into motion long ago. Uh, that notwithstanding, however, um, we need more training such as the training we're all engaged with today and dedicated like-minded um, folks such as yourselves, such as the folks on the, on the panel to undercut um, these underpinnings of archeological resource crime, uh, which are really in my view, uh, rooted in settler colonialism. Uh, next slide, please. So it should remember, it should be remembered that um, Congress uh, deliberately excluded pre-existing privately held collections of artifacts um, from ARPA's um, prohibition, prohibition on trafficking in part because they formed a valuable resource for academic study. Uh, so for example, ARPA's findings and purpose states and the bold part is my emphasis. Uh, the purpose of this chapter is to secure for the present and future benefit of the American people um, and for the exchange of information between governmental authorities, professional, uh, the professional archeological community and private individuals. Nowhere in there is it mentioned, um, you know, uh, that native uh, folks have a, a stake in this matter. Uh, further, only objects excavated subsequent to 1979 or unlawfully possessed prior to 1979 are impacted by ARPA. Um, Congress explicitly intended private collections to serve as open resources. Um, in addition to the shortcomings of some federal legislation intended to um, protect uh, tribal cultural heritage, um, some of the other major barriers we face are the vast amount of acreage that needs monitoring on a regular basis and the law enforcement resources are spread so thin in many of the hardest hit areas. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, there's one uh, field agent, Agent Frank Chavez in the cultural resources uh, unit um, who's responsible for really the enforcement of, of ARPA violations across the country, across Indian country. Um, in addition, because most of these laws apply only to objects taken from federal lands or tribal lands, there are often challenges to proving where the thefts occurred. Um, there's also a requirement uh, that the United States prove the defendant um, was aware of the facts and circumstances that constitute the crime. Um, and finally, the federal legislation generally apply only to actions after their passage. So we should all be very disturbed about the ongoing problems posed by the theft and sale of cultural items. Over many years, people have looted and sold important patrimony for financial gain. Um, over the last 30 years or so, however, we've become more aware of this problem. We meaning native folks, um, native communities, and there's been meaningful progress to pass laws to stop it, like NAGPRA and ARPA, uh, which, is built, uh, which was built on what was done with uh, like the Antiquities Act. Um, but these legislation all have their limitations, of course. Um, and I'm not too sure how going, uh, going about amending these, um, this legislation to, to make them have more teeth uh, would work. 
but I suspect that a congressional field hearing um, is a good place to start. Uh, next slide. So how are native people, how are native communities uh, taking up these causes in their respective nations? Um, like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm, I'm a deputy TIPO um, and many other tribes across Indian country are establishing tribal historic preservation programs that are responsible for protecting and preserving a tribe's cultural heritage. The National Historic Preservation Act states that federally recognized Indian tribes can assume the responsibilities of state historic preservation offices. Um, and this involves developing a historic preservation program um, where um, um, through these um, uh, TIPOs. So a TIPO provides oversight for several activities uh, including advising and assisting federal and state agencies and local governments in carrying out their historical preservation responsibilities. And part of the duties of a TIPO are to enforce the federal legislation intended to protect cultural heritage, such as ARPA. Um, so the list on the screen there um, is the most up-to-date list that I could find of TIPOs in Arizona. So these people on the screen, and I wish I could include all their pictures, are some of your biggest allies in the fight against archeological resources crime. They're dedicated stewards of their ancestral homelands. And I'd encourage all of you to engage with TIPOs um, and their programs when at all possible. So tribes and TIPOs across Indian country are actively reasserting their claims to items of cultural heritage uh, illegally taken from any and all lands and illegally sold and exported. So lastly, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of the efforts taken on by um, legislators in New Mexico um, in partnership with tribal communities in New Mexico and Arizona, such as the uh, STOP Act, which was brought to the attention through a congressional field hearing in October of 2016. So the STOP Act would um, increase Native American graves um, NAGPRA penalties to aid in deterrence. Um, it would explicitly prohibit the export of tribal cultural heritage obtained in violation of NAGPRA um, and ARPA and the Ant Antiquities Act. So it would create a federal framework to support voluntary return, the voluntary return of sacred items, including a referral program to uh, allow the Department of the Interior, Interior to assist individuals in finding a tribe with a cultural affiliation to tribal cultural heritage that they want to return. So hopefully the joint efforts of our legislators and tribes can bring this bill to a pass, which would allow for the greater protection of uh, tribal cultural heritage and would make all our jobs um, much more easier. Um, so that's all I have. And I'll not too sure where we're at in the uh, presentation, but I'll turn it back over to the host. Actually, Stacy's going to take over with questions and answers at this point. Um, what if I if I can ask you? Um, do you have an idea of how some tribes feel about site steward programs? That's a question that a lot of stewards ask. Um, is you know how do tribes feel about what we're doing? Yeah, I I can only speak on behalf of. Um, my Pueblo, uh, the general feeling is that we like we applaud the efforts of site stewards. I mean, um, if we could, if we had the capacity or even the authority to to engage in some of the um, the activities that site stewards are doing in their in their efforts to protect and preserve um, ancestral um, Pueblo, Navajo, Apache uh, tribal lands. Um, we could. Um, so I don't know. I I personally applaud the effort that site stewards are doing. It's um it's noble it's noble cause I think, um, and I think that's a general feeling. I think at least up here under the northern Rio Grande that, that we appreciate the, the efforts that the site stewards are putting forward. You, you know, we're getting ready to work on a a, a project to um, start opening up more communication with tribes in Arizona. Uh, we want to improve our training program for our members. Um, it's really missing a lot of cultural awareness training. So we want to reach out to tribes um, to see if they could help us 
you know, with that training. Is that, is that something that, that you've done there in New Mexico at all? Um, I haven't been involved in any kind of specific uh, cultural awareness training, but um, now that you bring it to my attention, I think that's probably one of the areas I think that would need to be addressed in, in site steward programs. Um, you know, there's just many site stewards or the, the programs themselves. Um, I think they could do a little bit more to engage with uh, tribal communities. Um, we can start by just reaching out to tribes and letting 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 them know what what exactly what activities you're involved in. Um, I just got um, uh, we just had a consultation or a meeting with site stewards in the Galiseo Basin here in New Mexico, um, and it was very productive. Um, but it just starts with that that simple form of just communication. I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. So we have a question that is really related to this for Joseph, and it's how do we participate in the THPO activities? And you did, you know, just answer Sean's question about how the site stewards can participate, but maybe is there anything you could recommend on more of an um, individual level? But especially now in the age of COVID, you know, the tribes are, are really super insulated. Um, and I, I, th I think it, it's, it's on the tribes and pueblos themselves to to do some outreach, I think. Um, but you know, most of most of tip, tipos that I'm familiar with, they're they're really small programs. A lot of them are one, two man operations, um, and we don't have the capacity really to engage or do outreach as much as we'd like. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have a real solution for how to to foster that engagement, um, but. I, I think just a part of reaching out, I think we, we know we get tons of requests for consultation uh, monthly. Um, and we, we closely look at every, every letter that comes through our, um, our inbox, whether that's uh, hard copies or emails. And, you know, we choose to engage where, where we do and we, we would really like to engage more with site stewards and it, um, it really just comes down to reaching out um, to start the process. Thank you. I was just going to add a few words to that uh, to note that I think in the conversations I've had with site stewards, um, it's been useful to learn from them about what their understanding is of how tribes work and how THPOs work. And um, sometimes there's been a, a sense of enlightenment when they realize that, you know, tribal lands are not like Bureau of Land Management lands or Forest Service lands. Um, you know, number one, you know, tribes get to decide who uh, enters and is allowed to stay and do whatever it is that they do on tribal lands. They're not public lands. And uh, I think site stewards um, appreciate that and at the same time uh, may not always understand that, you know, tribes are not funded on you know, a per acre or per archeological site or per tree sort of basis um, uh, for their land management. And that you know, when they are investing in THPO offices beyond the small federal grants that come in or investing in tribal you know, game and fish rangers or whatever, those are funds that you know, they are allocating you know, instead of to tribal community programs or education or scholarships or you know, health activities or whatever, um, that they are large and important and also very complex business operations that the tribes administer, uh, and, you know, that should not be confused with federal agencies. Uh, so it, 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 it takes some time to sort of appreciate some of these differences between tribal land management and cultural resource management on tribal lands compared to uh, especially federal agency lands, but also to a certain extent to state lands. Um, one of our participants uh, says, Sean, um, they're specifically interested in reaching out to tribes in Flagstaff, Coconino County, Arizona. Um, do you have any comments about that? Our plan is to, um, we are putting together an internship program um, and um, that in turn would work with tribes. Um, we, we, we did something um, last year with um, 
with a, a tribe in, in central Arizona where we, uh, Angela Garcia, I think some of you know who Angela is, uh, the Maricopa Pima tribe. Yeah, we did a video of her giving a presentation um, talking about, um, you know, her his the, the history of, of her tribe. Um, and then she mixed it in with cultural awareness training. It was fantastic. And so um, we want to build upon that. That's something that Will Russell had started before Will left, actually. Um, and so we want to build upon that and, and work with each of the tribes in Arizona, you know, to, and, and that, that'll help us again with that training and then also just developing these partnerships. So we've got another question. Is there any legal effort to stop European sales and to repatriate artifacts? Gary or Randy, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, here's, this is what I know about it. The Department of Interior has a, where all the solicitors have got together to address this and they're working with the State Department. And the State Department is one that we always have to hand off in this regard because it's international. And uh, we've made some inroads, the Department of the Interior has, as well as our, our group here, as a matter of fact, in that regard. And so it is mostly, though, a matter of the Cultural Affairs Office of the State Department. And I can jump in there as well. I was involved in a situation a few years ago when I was still in AUSA where somebody had bought something in Italy, brought it to a university in our state and the Italians found out about it. And we contacted the person and he gave it back. So that whole situation went through both the state department. There was an office at DOJ that did that. So it would have, it could have potentially have been an ARPA case uh, if, because Italy has signed a, a treaty uh, having to do with cultural property. So in, in countries like Guatemala, for example, that has, is a member of the treaty, we could actually have prosecuted somebody for uh, an ARPA violation. Uh, and DOJ does that as well. I've got another question for our legal team. Maybe Dusty can field this one. Um, Randy Rain was talking about the ability of remaining anonymous in Kentucky as a witness. What are the laws in Arizona on this? <laughs> well, I, I asked uh, the AUSA I spoke to in Phoenix if she happened to know what uh, Arizona's laws were with regard to anonymity. In Kentucky, it's, it's really pretty bad. If you give your name to a police officer in a statement, it's going to be down at the courthouse for the media to see and for the defense, that's how they get their discovery. It's not, it's open book discovery, so-called, unlike federal court, which definitely is not. So the AUSA I spoke to in Phoenix did not know, she hadn't practiced in state court for a long time. But what I would say to you is, if you're involved in a state, and it could be different in different counties, you know, it might be that one county is different from another county. So for me to be able to give an answer like that for the whole state, it's just almost impossible, but you definitely need to talk to your county prosecutor about uh, about that. But I, I think in the situation I gave it in, the lady in the example I gave wanted to head that off immediately. She spoke to the Corps of Engineers about it. The manager at the Corps of Engineers called me and says, hey, this lady wants to stay out of it. So that was my uh, cause too, to keep her out of it. So her, I knew that her name never showed up in, in any reports. And so that's how we handled it in my case. But the answer is, I really don't know. I think you need to check with the local prosecutors in, in different parts of Arizona about that. Randy, you know, the safe steward program, we, we cover every county. So we have stewards in every county. Um, in case, should we just be work? Should I be talking to the AG's office instead? I think that would be a great place to start. Um, okay. uh, um, talking to the state AG's office. I mean, I, obviously that's an issue. That was an issue with our site steward. It's an issue with your folks as well. I definitely would want to, to, to know what the law is and if it varies from location to location. Okay, thanks Randy. So we've got a question. I think this should be for Gary. 
There are many examples of people selling or sharing information over the internet. Is there a concerted effort or staff assigned to this issue? Yes. And uh, we've been ongoing for a number of years now and it's been pretty productive. And uh, what's happening also, particularly with our case, a lot of tribal entities have become aware of this and they've been directing a lot of information our way too, as a matter of fact. So yes, uh, some of it should be ideally, we could have some uh, coordination because we've had situations where we had a special agent purchasing one undercover but he was competing with the tribe that was buying at the same time. <laughs> and so it went over a little bit more than, than what it was, but yes. And I'm sure there, that's just our part right there. I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff going on by other federal agencies that are monitoring is being brought to their attention. But anybody who's done any, any exploration on the internet is probably aware of the degree that's going on out there. And it's surprising that all of it came from private property. Surprising, you know, so. And that's an issue for us. We have to approve otherwise, okay? G Gary, I'm sorry. That the first part you said, do you, um, you said you have a, a team or a few, few folks that monitor social media posts? I'm aware that it's going on. Okay, Sean. Okay. All right, because we. Um, Not social media posts, internet. Okay, all right. Yeah, because we are, um, um, you know, this is a big discussion that came up um, in June. We we hosted a meeting with a lot of land managers and the regional coordinators and assistants, and um, you know how to address uh, you know these issues of internet and, and whatnot. And we're um, going to put together a team of stewards who will help monitor sites and and then in this case social media posts. Um, so a coordinated effort. And then, um, so we, in fact, we had an example uh, last week at a concerned citizen who called me about a hiking club that started posting sites. And the sites that they were posting um, were site steward sites. So um, we reached out, I reached out to the regional coordinator and they went out um, immediately to, to look at the area, make sure that um, no damage has been done yet. And then now we're just starting um, uh, a lot, we're just being more active with stewards in that area now. I wanted to footnote the previous conversation about um, um, the protection of witness names in Arizona. My recollection is that they are protected, but I couldn't actually find anything on that. But what I did find is that specifically there's an Arizona state statute that provides for the non-disclosure of any um, silent witness or, or crime stopper type of um, uh, witness statements. So witnesses are protected uh, if they are providing information about criminal activity to a silent witness crime stopper operation game thief program uh, administered by a police department, sheriff's department, county's attorney. So that's interior to the state. Uh, it doesn't say anything about connections to federal activities or, you know, another initiative like ours. So it's not super clear from just this, but it's at least something to indicate that the state has attended to it at some level. Thank you. Um, somebody asks, drones have become an issue. Are there any laws or regulations that address this matter? And I'm not sure if that means an issue in um, looking for sites on tribal lands? Maybe I can jump in there. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, uh, I, know, I know the Fourth Amendment law on a spy in the sky or a drone or anything like that, uh, you know, you, you can't get you know, close enough to be able to observe. You can do a general flyover. And, and I don't, you know, we've discussed it here, uh, you know, looking at sites to see if if there's been damage, it's something that we don't know if the technology is there or not. But I mean, as far as hovering over someone's house you know, as a suspect with a drone, that's probably going to require a warrant. So I think most people probably understand that. And evaluating them as targets 
uh, for looting. Uh, they've been in, observed in archaeologically, you know, known areas, especially super rugged terrain, um, inspecting cliff faces, um, getting close to rock shelters uh, to examine whether or not they're sitting on roofs, these types of things. Uh, a number of tribes have taken up the matter of determining whether or not to uh, follow the National Park Service in prohibiting drone activities in their airspaces. Um, I'm not aware of any tribes that have explicitly prohibited that, but I wouldn't be surprised that at least some have. Um, Joseph might know of examples from Arizona or for, from New Mexico or elsewhere, uh, but it is, it, it's, it's certainly a topic of uh, interest and concern in, in this environment. I think the message for the stewards is that if you see drone activity um, and you suspect it's being, a drone is being used, uh, then get as much information as you can, just the same way that you would if you had other suspicious activity in the neighborhood. That would be my advice, Sean. You can, of course, redirect um, if that's not appropriate. I wanted to make a comment about, again, how um, incredibly grateful uh, I am and I feel like the whole team is to to Joseph for stepping in more or less at the last minute. So I wanted to just acknowledge that and, and tell you how appreciated uh, this is to have this perspective and how valuable your words are uh, in this type of a context. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm happy to be part of it and feel free to reach out to me anytime. We do have a follow-up question to the issue of drones. Uh, a Facebook site, Ancient Exploring of Arizona, have posted drone video of hard to reach places in the Sierra Anchas. Others have posted videos of visitations to site sewered sites. What can be done about this? Be another Randy question, but I would say off the top of my head, not bloody very much, especially if it's on public lands and unless and until a land manager decides that um, the interests and in the protection of their resources are such that they want to try to prohibit drone activity in the area, um, then uh, people that are licensed drone operators are free to use them on uh, around unrestricted airspace. So not on or around Department of Defense lands, or they probably very swiftly find themselves in, uh, under investigation uh, and not on National Park Service lands where drones are prohibited. But as far as I know, um, everywhere else that is is fair game. I agree, John, uh, as long as, you know, the person to complain to would certainly be the manager of that particular property. If it's Grand Canyon National Park, for example, it would be someone there, but I'm not aware of the Code of Federal Regulations banning them or any specific portions of, of, a, of an area being banned. So right now, I guess it's, it's wide open. The only other follow-up I would say is that doesn't in any way mean that the site steward shouldn't pay close attention to what's going on with the drone. You know, chances are good that it's, you know, innocent what should we call it? Like, you know, voyeuristic activities. Like people want to know what's going on, you know, in cliff faces and in difficult areas. They want to test their skills as drone operators in a place like the Sierra Ancha, where you have these rugged cliff faces and you may or may not be able to, uh, you know, um, heft your dimpled rump up to one of those cliff faces to see what's in there. Um, so they're sending a drone so that they can get, you know, uh, up close and personal with some of the places. And oftentimes it's just going to be innocent activity. But if it's being broadcast, especially in some kind of a lurid way, to signal that this is a place that should be, you know, visited for the purposes of, of treasure hunting and all the rest of it, then I would think a land manager would take very keen interest in this and want to make note of who was involved, the, you know, the times and the dates and all the rest of it, and keep that on record in case there was indeed nefarious activity that followed. Because um, that person that did that, I think, would share responsibility for that nefarious activity, so. Well, we're coming real close to the end of our two hours. Um, and I really wanna thank all of the panelists, um, site stewards, uh, you've come together um, giving a good chunk of your, your day and you do a lot of really positive things for the archeological resources, the, your commitment to uh, broadening your 
outreach to, to tribes, to getting broader ranges of experience is really, really appreciated. And uh, we thank you all for coming together today. You've seen um, what we're trying to do in terms of creating um, innovations and you know, kind of a new set of, of best practices um, in the focus on tribal lands. Uh, have, again, have to acknowledge Gary Cantley's innovations and commitments to this over many, many, many long years. So Gary, thank you for bringing all of us together. Um, and at this point, um, we will thank uh, you one final time and uh, say adieu and uh, till we meet again. Yeah, and, and again, thank all of you for, for being here this afternoon. Uh, to help provide this training to, uh, to site stewards. So um, this is part of a big effort of providing more trainings, especially during the era of COVID. Uh, and it was wonderful to have so many excellent speakers. So thank all of you for, for, for being out here today.